Yeah, man. You know something? What? We party people, man. What? That's right. Ain't no party like a city line party. Ain't no party like a city line party. Ain't no party like a city line party. Cause a city line party don't stop. A city line party don't stop. Said a city line party don't stop. Ain't no party like a city line party. Ain't no party like ours, man. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, can I be real with you? If church ain't fun, you're doing it wrong. I'm telling you, you're doing it wrong. But hey, welcome to church this morning. I'm so glad that you are here. I'm excited that you're joining in with us. And if you're new here, it's your first time, I want to welcome you. My name's Jack, and I get to be one of the pastors here. And we're thrilled that you chose to spend time with us this morning. And I want to say hello to those tuning in online uh, in our live feed. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Maybe you're on vacation. Maybe you're just kind of uh, hanging out uh, sick at home today. Or maybe you're just in another state and you consider yourself a part of our community of faith. We love you and we thank you for tuning in. Man, I'm excited because today we're going to jump into this uh, new series that we're kicking off today called Party People. And, and I get it. For some of you, you know, you, you see kind of the, the bumper video and you see the graphics and you're just kind of like, uh, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like other people, you're just kind of like, woo! You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I love my church. You know what I mean? Because it all depends on your church background, your church kind of upbringing. I mean, there's lots of different views of church. But, but the reality is you and I, we know that like celebration and joy and party and festivities, that that's really all a part of who we are as people. We, we know that kind of at the most basic level. We, we celebrate all kinds of things. It's not uncommon for us to go to parties, but, but it all depends on our outlook when it comes to church. That, that's what changes everything. I mean, dynamics seem to change there, and we, we don't really know, like, hey, is this whole party thing something that, that we really can be about? Or I, I mean, you know, most of you, maybe your upbringing in church was a bit different. Maybe you, you have a background where you went to church, but, but yet uh, it was almost like when everybody said, hey, it's time for church, it was like, gosh, you know what I mean? Like, uh, how long is that going to take, right? Or you went because the payoff was lunch afterwards, right? And, and then when you got there, it seemed like nobody was happy when you got there. It was kind of solemn. It was just kind of boring. And your parents gave you the talk on your way in, like, don't move. Don't do anything. Don't talk. Like, just look straight ahead. You know what I mean? So, I mean, maybe there was music. Maybe there was no music. But, I mean, everybody's just kind of, you know. And then they really told you about this idea of being happy. And you're like, that's funny because uh, apparently somebody forgot to tell your face. You know what I mean? Because, like, it just didn't feel real happy, right? And then some of you, you're new to church. Church is new to you. Jesus, this idea of faith and stuff is new to you. Or you're skeptical about this stuff and you come to church, you have questions and you're just not sure like what to do. Uh, do. Do I stand? Do I sit? Do I, I mean, and then you walk in and to this place and you see people jumping up and down, like people like raising the roof and you know, and you're like, oh, this is, can, can that happen in church? And really what you want to know is that yes, yes, that's, that's really what church is about because we, believe it or not, are a party people. Yeah, you can clap in church, that's fine. 1130 is going to love this message. I can tell already. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be, it's going to be good. You know, but here's the deal. You know, you know, David, David says in Psalms 122, I, was, I rejoiced when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. There was something that David knew that there was an excitement, there was an anticipation, there was a celebration, there was a party, there was something to look forward to when it was coming to the house of God. It wasn't something that, you know, was just like, uh, I don't know, I think I'd avoid it that weekend. It wasn't something that people felt bad about doing. It wasn't something that people just checked off their to-do list. There was excitement about coming to the house of the Lord. Here's my hope over the next few weeks as we talk about what it means to be party people, is that we would allow God to work in our heart in such a way that it changes our perspective on on how we live as Jesus followers. That even in spite of our circumstances, in spite of what's going on around us, in spite of our world and everything that's happening in our world, that we would see that we have been crafted from the very beginning to be a people of joy and celebration. Yeah. 
In fact, some of you come to the church and you're just like, yeah, you guys are always talking about party. You guys got a party for this and a party for that. And you say, ain't no party like a city. And, and pastor, you know, ain't, ain't a word. You know what I mean? And like, and you get all like, you know, technical on us, you know, and you're like, what does this, you know, party thing mean anyway? Here's what I want to suggest to you about this idea of party is that God has always been a God of celebration from the very beginning. And because God doesn't change, and because God remains the same today, yesterday, and forever, there's nothing that's changed about God as it relates to us. God is still very much a God of celebration. He's, he's, a, he's a God of joy. He's a God of party. He's a party-type God. And what's so crazy about God is that, is that God made us to party. Paul knew about it. He understood it. He told the church about it in his letter to the, the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, and 18. He says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. And you're just kind of like, you know, anytime you read scripture, you got to pause for a second and, and you got to ask yourself the question, how am I doing with that? Is this representative of our lives? Because sometimes we want to know this, right? We want to know what's God's will for my life. What is God calling me to? And sometimes it feels elusive. It feels like we're chasing the carrot. It feels like I don't know what to do next. And, and have I really found it? Have I not found it? When will I know if I found it? And, there's all, and Paul says, let me help you with something. Here's some foundational pieces for you to have, make clear that, that runs across every Christ follower. He says, look, rejoice always. This is God's will for your life. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks, rejoice, pray, give thanks in all circumstances. Why would we ever want to do that, Paul? He says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Well, I don't understand. Well, what are you saying that means? What I'm saying or what I'm suggesting today is that from the very beginning, God has designed us, you and me, to be known as a people of joy and celebration. Hopefully you're taking some notes today because I think there's going to be some stuff that's going to be important to you. I realized over the 8.30 and the 10 o'clock service, I have way too much on my notes today. So uh, surprise, we're not going to get through it all today. Um, but, but just track with me and I'll tell you how we'll pick it up again next week. But just take some notes because I think this is going to be important for you. From the beginning, God's designed us, designed us to be known as a people of joy and celebration. Not a people of sorrow, not a people of remorse, not, not a people that has sunk deep in our, in our, in our state of angst and anxiety. That, that's not God's will for our life. God's will for our life is that we be a people that rejoices, a people that is continually communicating with God, that we're praying all times with God. In other words, we're not just praying to God when we need something. We're not just praying to God when we feel like we need him to, to bail us out of something. We're not just praying to God and praying once, right? And then thinking, well, God didn't answer my prayer, so so much for that. Or feeling like, you know what? I prayed and my, my prayers didn't really, I mean, felt like they con something started to happen, but then it's like they hit the ceiling and they fell back down again. You know, like, I mean, no, he's saying you pray continuously. You develop communication with God. And communication is not always about you asking for what you want. It's also about you listening to what God is saying. Sometimes we don't know what next step to take and what to do is because we spend so much time telling God what we need and how we want him to do it that we're not listening to what he's actually calling us to. Yeah. The reality is, from the beginning, God has designed us to be known as a people of joy and a people of celebration. Leviticus chapter 23, if you have your Bibles and your notes, you want to follow along. We're also going to talk a little bit about it on the screen. This is going to be important for us. We're going to take a look at the Old Testament. Sometimes we don't spend a lot of time in the Old Testament, and this is one of those Old Testament kind of books that here's kind of what happens. Like, you, you know, you get all fired up about Jesus, and you're like, hey, I should read my Bible. And so you say, I'm going to read my Bible. And so you say, well, how am I going to do that? You're like, well, I'm going I'm going to start at Genesis, and I'm just going to read all the way through, right? And then you read Genesis, and you're like, this is cool. You read Exodus, you're like, that was fascinating. You get to Leviticus, you're like, I tap out. You know what I mean? Like, I just, you know, like, I, I just don't get it. You know, it's like complex, and it's like, hey, there's all this stuff that he's talking about that just doesn't seem to make sense to me, you know? Really what God is doing in Leviticus is God is setting up his expectations for his people, God is giving some expectations for the way that the people of God should carry out their lives, should live out their lives. The, the expectation of what does it look like to live a God-honoring life. And there's fascinating stuff all throughout the book of Leviticus. A lot of it, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't sound a whole lot like the way that we live our lives, and for good reason. But, but the reality is, is there's plenty in there that points us to what we should be celebrating as a people of God. 
that points us to what we should be thinking through as it relates to our life and the way that we experience joy in our life. And I want us to look at that today because it's fascinating what Leviticus says. Leviticus 23 starts, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them. Now, before I get there, I want to catch up on the story. You, some of you know the story. At least you saw the movie. Right, you know, you know, from the very beginning, Genesis, right? There's God, he creates everything. He creates, you know, mankind. He creates all the things, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, everything. And he creates humans to be in relationship with God and relationship with others. But humans go against God's plan for their life. And now there's sin that has taken place in the world. And God is on a relentless pursuit to continue to restore and redeem humanity. Humanity kind of gets close to God, but then just enough that it gets close, then it kind of retracts itself from God and keeps doing the the opposite of what God is calling it to. And now we, we arrive at the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus where suddenly you have the people of God that are actually in slavery, like enslaved, not just spiritually, not just mentally, but physically in bondage, working under the heavy labor of the Egyptians. And God sees what's going on. He hears the cries of his people and God says, enough is enough. Uh, enough is enough that I'm going to send a rescue for my people. I'm going to send uh, Moses to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. You guys tracking along the story now? Like, so you're like, okay, yeah, I remember that one. Okay, it's good. So now they've been delivered out of Egypt. And now God is trying to establish expectations for his people because how many of you know, once you've been living an old way for so long, you get used to that old way. And that old way, you just become accustomed to it. You kind of become conditioned to it. And some of those old tendencies don't really work in the new way that God is calling us to. So God is trying to shape things. He's trying to help people to understand what does it look like to live a God-honoring life. So the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed festivals. Isn't that fascinating? God says, hey, tell, tell my people, to speaking to Moses, tell my people, hey, here's how you guys are going to party. You're like, wait a second. The expectation that you have for your people, God, is that we party? He says, yes. Here's the expectation for you, that you would be a party people. In fact, here's what I want you to do. These are appointed festivals, meaning these are scheduled festivals. These are things that I am actually calling you to write down on the calendar that you should participate in find it fascinating that he says festivals. Because how many of you know in our culture, we know a little thing or two about festivals, right? I see some of you guys, you know what I'm saying? Coachella, you know what I mean? Like, stagecoach, you know what I mean? Like, all this stuff, you know, you're all about the festival. You know, it's kind of funny that the world tries to throw something flashy out there, like if it's the next best thing. When you look back at scripture, you're like, man, festival's been happening for a minute. You know, like, like God started this whole thing. But you know what was different about God? God's parties had a purpose. It wasn't just good music. It wasn't just to hang out with others. God's parties had a purpose. So he says, these are my appointed parties, my appointed festivals, the appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim. You are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. What? Yeah, the sacred assemblies, that these parties had significance, that these parties were actually a sacred act established by God himself. These festivals are something sacred that God was calling his people to, to participate in for a significant purpose. And he says, it's more than just throwing a party. And it's being, no, he says that these are actually spiritual acts. These are sacred acts. They're a sacrament. You're like, sacrament? Oh, that word sounds familiar. Is there sacraments that we seem to observe in the church? Yes. One of them we'll see today, baptism. We're going to celebrate with people as they proclaim Jesus as Lord of their life through baptism. They're going public with their faith. There's this outward expression of an inward commitment to say yes to Jesus, that we are called as the people of God to party it up, right? To celebrate that. Yeah. Next week, we're going to spend some time partying too because this is going to be a several-week party because that's what we see in Scripture, right? You know, it's just, we're going to party through communion, Another sacrament where we remember the, the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what he is calling us to. It's a sacrament. He says these parties are a sacred act that have been instituted by God himself, that you would be a party people. And then Leviticus, in Leviticus, he goes on to list seven different celebrations that scholars say when you add it all up and you add a, the, the, the Sabbath that they were keeping and the other religious sacraments that they were called to, that there was an, on average about three months of partying throughout the calendar year. Whoo! I was like, all right, let's go, God. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
you know, a little much, but there's a reason for it. There, 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 there's a purpose for it. And I want us to take a look at the purpose. You, on your notes, uh, we try to leave some space so that you can jot these things down. Maybe those of you that write fast, you can write some of these things down. Or you can just write down Leviticus 23, and you can read through that this week. But these things are to help you. I want to highlight what's being talked about because, again, they sound different or strange to us. But I think they're significant and important to us because they show us what you and I should be celebrating. And God, he first begins in verse 3 with this idea of Sabbath. Now, what you got to know about Sabbath is many of us understand Sabbath. We've heard of Sabbath. We know Sabbath as rest. And I would agree that Sabbath is rest, that God intentionally carves into his plan for his people that you would work, but you would also rest, that you would work for six days and then you would rest. This idea of Sabbath was not new to the people of God at this point. They understood the significance of Sabbath and what Sabbath was supposed to be. But I am thinking that the quicker you read, the more you read this, you're starting to understand that God was sending a reminder, a reminder of what Sabbath actually is, a reminder of the significance and the importance of taking that rest and why that rest is important for your life. Because he goes on to say that you have to be reminded of what the Sabbath is, just like you and I sometimes forget or maybe twist what the Sabbath might be. In other words, he says that Sabbath doesn't mean that you isolate yourself from your community of faith to get your rest. He doesn't say that, that the Sabbath is actually uh, equal to uh, locking yourself away in your room and binging on Netflix. <laughs> he doesn't say that, that, that Sabbath, that Sabbath, get this, he doesn't say that Sabbath is equal to sleeping in late, right, catching local brunch as long as you catch up with church online later in the week. Those that are tuning in online, we love you. He, he doesn't say that Sabbath is synonymous with sports. I think you know where I'm going. I'm just going to leave it right there, right? He says you'll work six days, and on the seventh day, you would carve out time to pause and take rest, that you would not just rest and disconnect from the world or society. But he goes on in verse 3, and he says there's six days when you will work. On the seventh day is a Sabbath rest, a day of sacred assembly. You know what that means? It's a day of corporate gathering in the house of God where the people of God get together and celebrate God and who he is and what he's done and what he will do. You know what that is? That's City Line Sunday. <laughs> what? That's why we say there's no better way to start your Sunday than right here at City Line Church. We truly believe that. Am I saying that Netflix is bad? No. Am I saying that sports is bad? No. Am I saying that your brunch is bad? No. All those things are good things, but they cannot replace the one thing that God wants for you. He wants you to connect with others to celebrate who he is and what he is doing in and through your life and the church as a corporate body. That's significance of the parties were a sacrament, a, a sacred act uh, established by God himself for the benefit of the people. So he starts out with Sabbath, and then he goes on to the Passover. Some of you are familiar with the Passover. You, you get what the Passover was all about because you, you know the stories that, that, that we understand that had been told that, that God is freeing the Hebrew people from Egyptian slavery. He's doing that through lots of different special acts, these, these, these kind of plagues that are going on. And he tells them to put the blood of a lamb over the door and that, that he would pass over them and keep them safe. As he was delivering them out, he was, he was disconnecting them from the strongholds and the chains and, and the bondage that they had lived in for so long. In other words, he was saying, I don't want you to forget that. You celebrate as a way of remembrance, and what you're celebrating is rescue and deliverance by the power of God. You're celebrating rescue and deliverance by the power of God. I wonder if any of us in the room have ever been there and we begin to celebrate in that way, that our lives is a celebration of the rescue and the deliverance by the power of God himself at work in our life. 
Everybody has a before Christ moment, right? And then everybody has after I met Jesus. But you know that before Christ moment, you can look back and see that there were some things that had enslaved you, some things that had tangled you up, some things that were walls and barriers that came between you and God. But when you gave your life to God, he sent rescue and he delivered you from those things. He tore down those walls and he removed those chains so that you can live in freedom. Not by your strength, not by anything you did, but by his power at work in your life. He goes on, he says, there's the Passover, but there's also the festival of unleavened bread to which you're like, I like bread. You know, like <laughs> God's about carbs. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's good, you know, but unleavened bread, like, what does that mean? You know, like, how does that, how does that work? He says this festival of unleavened bread is important because it also ties into that deliverance from Egypt. That when God said, hey, time to pack it up and let's go, people were still baking bread. God said, no, I said, let's go. You know what I'm saying? They didn't even have time for their bread to rise. They just grabbed it and they were like, we'll call it flat bread. You know what I'm saying? And we're just like, get it. it's unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. God delivers them from that. They take their bread that didn't have time to rise. They take that with them and they begin to eat off of that bread. And that bread was sustainable. What are they celebrating in that moment? God's saying you celebrate leaving an old life behind for a brand new way of life moving forward. He says, you leave that old way of life behind, even though things looked a certain way, and even though you were used to certain norms of that old life, here's what I'm inviting you to. I'm inviting you to a brand new life. Let me tell you, that's something to celebrate. That's something to party about. That's something to get excited about when you choose to receive the new life that God is calling you to. He says, hey, you celebrate that. He also said, there's a celebration of first fruits, a one-day celebration of first fruits. And some of you, you've been around church a long time. You hear first fruits. You're like, uh-oh, here comes the giving talk. You know what I'm saying? Hey, we already took up offering today. You can breathe easy. You know what I mean? Like, everything's good. First fruits was the beginning of the barley harvest. The beginning of the barley harvest was meaning that they were taking the very first crops that began to sprout at the barley harvest, pulling them, and before doing anything else with them, they would first lift them up to God. They would wave them before God as an offering to him, an offering of thanks to God. You know what's so powerful about that? Isn't it true that if you're planting something, those of you that like to plant things in gardens, when you are planting the seed, aren't you planting that seed in faith? Aren't you planting that seed with some kind of expectation, some kind of anticipation of what is to come? You may not see it right away. It might not happen when you want to, but there's an expectation that if I plant this and if I stay faithful with this, that there is going to be a harvest right? He's saying in this moment, what you're celebrating is simply this, God's provision for his people. And guess what you're doing? You're doing that in advance. <laughs> this is the beginning of the barley harvest, right? You're taking the first little inklings of what's going on. You're shaking it before God and saying, God, thank you for your provision. God, I thank you for providing for me. But God, I don't know what the rest of this harvest is going to look like. I don't know the outcomes or the turnout of this, but guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to praise you in advance. I'm going to party while I wait. God, I'm going to press into you and I'm going to allow you to work in my situation. Why? Because I'm giving you my first fruits. I'm trusting you with it all. I'm not just going to give you a little bit. I'm giving you everything. He says, you celebrate that. He goes on, he says, there's the Pentecost. Some of you know about Pentecost. Some of you say, I used to go to a Pentecostal church, right? You know what I mean? And that meant something to you. You know what I mean? It was like, that, that was high energy. Talk about a party people, right? Like that, that was a party, right? You saw all kinds of stuff going on. I, I was there too. But Pentecost is significance, right? This was a, a festival. This was a celebration. This was something that God was doing. This is the end of the first fruits harvest season. This is at the end of that harvest season. It was 50 days following that harvest season where they would begin to thank and praise God, not just for his provision, but they would give thanks to God for the harvest that had been received and the blessings of God. Pentecost is all about the harvest that had been received and the blessings of God that was given to his people, not just at the beginning of harvest, but out of that anticipation, out of planting those seeds of hope and of faith, that suddenly this harvest, they did see it. They did experience it in their time. You know what's awesome about Pentecost? It's also that it was a foreshadow of what was to come through Christ Jesus that Jesus would come, that God promised that he would be with us, his people, and that when he did, that he would have his spirit live and dwell inside of us. Some of you remember Acts chapter two, right? You've read that, you know, where, where suddenly they're in the upper room. Guess what? About 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know what Pentecost means? 50. That's pretty awesome, right? Everybody's like, wow, wow, you know, like it's cool. 50, it's a foreshadowing of what was to come that God would bring the harvest, that we would receive the blessings of God through the power of his Holy Spirit at work in our life. But it doesn't stop there. He goes on to the fifth feast. He said is the feast of trumpets. 
The Feast of Trumpets. You can just imagine what that might have sounded like, right? You got ram's horns and you got like little metal things. I was like, brruh, brruh, you know, like everybody's just going after it, right? This idea of this Feast of Trumpets and what were they saying? They were, they were signifying the end of the agricultural year and the beginning of a new civil year. They, they were, you know, kind of putting an end to something and, and introducing a beginning to something else. And as they were doing it, guess what they were saying? They were celebrating the fact that God is with us, that the presence of God is here. But also they were signifying that in eternity, we'd be in eternity with pre- in the presence of God forever. They were, they, were, they were praying in advance for that. They were believing in advance for that, that God would come not to just be with us, that God wasn't just there during that harvest season, but that we would be together in eternity in the presence of God forever. How powerful is that? That's something to celebrate, something to be excited about, the Feast of Trumpets. And then what about this, the atonement? Some of you are familiar with the Festival of Atonement or the Feast of Atonement. This was this, this one-day festival that, 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 that signified that God, he would provide you know, this, this sacrifice for the people, that God would take away the sins of the people. In the Old Testament, they would spend one day going to the temple, and people would kind of bring their sinful life to the temple. And, and as a sign, it's a symbolism of that sin being gone, that the priest would take all that sin and, and, and symbolically place it on a goat, right? And then they would take that goat out in front of the people so people could recognize that this is the sin that has been a part of your life but because of God and his goodness he is taking it away and they would release that goat they would get that goat out of the temple they would get that goat out of that space and they would allow that goat to head out into the wilderness as a sign of guess what your sin is gone that you have been forgiven, that God has cleared that out of the way, that he has knocked that completely out of your life. You don't have to stay in that shame and that guilt anymore. What is he saying? He says you need to celebrate that God provides a way to be restored in a right relationship with him. Not only was it about the goat, not only was it about the Old Testament, but here's what they're doing. They're celebrating in this moment what God has done, but also, get this, what God would do through Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is going to come, and he's going to be the ultimate sacrifice once and for all. He's going to take the cross and give his life for us so that you and I can be restored into a right relationship with God. Amen, somebody? I, I mean, this party people, right? Like, I, I might get a little excited today, and I apologize, but, you know, no, I don't apologize. I, I, I think that we should be this way. This is the way we should live our life, right? This is the way that we're living in our life. The next one is this. This is our Feast of Tabernacles, right? This is fascinating. The seventh feast that he talks about is after their 40 years of wandering. Remember, they, they, they were delivered out of Egypt, and they're wandering in the desert for 40 years. God has promised them a promised land, and they're looking for this promised land, but they're grumbling, and they're complaining, and they're just walking in circles, not willing to, to step into the new thing that God has called them for. And as they're wandering in the desert for 40 years, they're living in temporary shelters, How many of you know that sometimes you're going through a temporary thing right now? There's a season going on in your life, and God is calling you to greater. God has a promise in store for you, and he just needs you to continue to trust in him that what seems temporary right now and hard and difficult right now, it's only a matter of time before you walk in something greater, that you get some permanence in your life, that you get some deliverance in your life. He says the Festival of Tabernacles is so fascinating because you celebrate the fact that you can trust in God's guidance and protection no matter what the circumstance no matter what's going on, no matter what the issue, this is cause to celebrate. This is a reason to be a party people. This is a reason, it's more than just a celebration. It's more than just a remembrance, but it's it's actually this foreshadowing of what is to come. I love that. You know why? Because you and I, we're a party people because we live on this side of the cross. That everything they looked for, not only did they celebrate, but everything that they looked for, everything they had desired in a soon coming Messiah, that was the promise, that the Messiah would come, that it would be Emmanuel, that it would be God with us, that one day that this would happen, they looked for that, they believed in that, they lived in the hope of that. But guess what? You and I, we live on this side of that, the fact that Jesus actually came, that Jesus showed up, Emmanuel happened. How do we know? Scripture records it. (laughs) I love this part. Scripture records it. And and he says it like this. He says in Luke 2, verse 10, he says, but the angel said to them, don't be afraid. Now, Now, just kind of think about what's going on, right? You got shepherds watching their flocks by night. You know, you know the Christmas story. You got everything happening. You know, and suddenly, you know, they hear this, this trumpet sound. They hear all this stuff, commotion going on. Angels show up and these guys are freaked out. And they're like, hey, don't, don't be afraid. Sometimes we live our lives that way. Sometimes we live our lives afraid, right? Unsure about what's next, unsure about what's going on. We live in hope, we live in anticipation, we want things, but we still live with a certain amount of fear. 
God shows up, and when God shows up, he drives out fear. When God shows up, he removes all fear. Why? Because perfect love, it always casts out that fear. The angel shows up, and I think it's fascinating, the first proclamation that he says before he gives you the good news is that, hey, you don't have to fear no more. You don't have to be afraid. Why? Because I bring you good news. Good news that will cause, get this, great Can you say that like you mean it? Great joy. joy. Okay, so good news that will cause great joy for a few people. (laughs) For, for For the smartest ones in the room, right? For the ones that have the most intellectual capacity to actually fully get their minds wrapped around what God is doing. No, he says, don't be afraid because I bring you good news that's going to cause great joy for all people, for you and I, all people, not just for the Hebrews, not just for the Jews, not not just for Israel, for all people. He says, good news, great joy, all people. It's available to you and I to live a lifestyle that is honoring to God, that is a life of joy and a life of celebration, not because of anything that we have done, but because of everything that God has done. We celebrate who God is, what he's done, and get this, what we still know that he will do because his promises are true, that God doesn't fail, that God doesn't give up, that we look back and we see that God has been faithful. Sing about it today, right? Great is your faithfulness, God. You have been so faithful. Great is your faithfulness. We love to sing that. It's important to sing that. It's important to know that. But it's also important to know that, God, if you did it before, guess what? By faith, I know you'll do it again. That, God, if you've done it before, I can trust that you're going to do it again. Why? Because you are God. You are God and you are in control. It's good news that it's going to cause great joy for all of the people. God was at work and he was doing something. And I think this is so significant because I get it. Sometimes the pushback is simply this. The pushback is like, yeah, yeah, but my life. <laughs> yeah, but there's real world. And yeah, but there's this. And it's sometimes, you know, the pushback of, of, of Christ followers and Christianity is like, you know, they kind of just live in a bubble. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's like, they, you know, they don't live in the real world. You know, they just kind of pretend like everything is okay. They pretend like everything is good. No, that, that's not who we are. That's not what God intended for our life. God intended our lives to actually be lived out in true joy. Why? Because we don't party in the hopes of escaping reality. We party because of our reality. I want want to explain that. Isn't isn't it true? Isn't it true that that you remember, remember, I know it's not just me, so you remember, you go to parties, right? You go to parties for the sake of escape. You go to parties for the sake of escape. You go to parties and you you drink or you or you do whatever. You know what I mean? You 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 use your vices to to have some momentary joy. You want to numb the pain. You you want things to to go away. You you want to try to get some kind of peace and joy, even if it's just for a couple hours. But how many of you know when you wake up and your head is pounding and you wake up and you can't remember half of what happened and you wake up and you're you're on the walk of shame all the way back to wherever you came from, knowing that you you know what? This is not sustainable. Knowing that this does not equal joy, knowing that there's got to be more to life than what I'm living now. How many of you know that when you're partying just to try to escape reality, reality still stares at you in the face in the morning? But I love that as a Christ follower, because of what Jesus has done, we don't party in the hopes of escaping reality. We party because of our reality. We party because of Jesus. That means that we don't turn a blind eye to our reality. We don't turn a blind eye to the circumstances in our life. We don't turn a blind eye to the, to the brokenness of our world. No, as Christ followers, you know what we do? We actually roll up our sleeves and we actually get involved in what's happening in our world. We actually do justice. We walk humbly. We love others, right? Micah 6, 8, he tells us that we come alongside what's going on in our world and we shine a light in dark places, that we begin to bring the joy and the celebration in places that haven't seen joy and celebration in a long time. We bring something that fills up an atmosphere, fills up a room that is Jesus and his love for others to places that have been empty and desolate for so long. Think about this. We, we party in, in spite of our reality. We don't ignore the reality. We lean into the reality, but we know where our confidence lies. We know that our God is greater. We know that we're more than conquerors. Yeah. Got any fans in the room? Any fans? Sports fans? Yeah. Football fans? Yeah. Baseball fans? Yeah. yeah? Anybody watching the World Cup? Yeah. Okay? Figured. <laughs> Figured. Figured that. It's good. It's a fun time, right? You know what I know about fans? Fans get crazy. Fans are wild. 
Fans are crazy and wild, especially when their team is winning. Especially when their team gives them something to be proud about or, or excited about. Fans will go to the extremes to jump up and down. Fans will wave their hands. Fans will make noise. Fans will paint their faces and sometimes their body. Fans will wear their favorite colors. Fans will rock the jersey. But here's what I know about fans. When the team's not doing so well, we leave the face paint alone. When the team's not doing too good, it's harder and harder to put on the jersey. When, the face, when, the, when it's not doing too good, I mean, think about it. When your team is winning, when everything is going in the right direction, you get loud, you cheer, you scream at your TV as if somebody's actually hearing you. We know that too. We do those things naturally, right, because we're a fan. Nobody likes to be considered a bandwagoner, but we all know that when our team's not doing good, it's a lot harder to cheer. You know what's crazy? There's a huge difference between a fan and a follower. There's a big difference between someone who is just a fan, but somebody who actually follows, someone who is actually committed, somebody who is actually on board, no matter what the circumstance, that's what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus didn't say life was going to be easy. He didn't say things that were going to be just all daisy-like and perfect, and, you know, it's a dream ever since God came into my life. You know what I mean? No, he's saying that in this world, you're going to have problems. In this world, you can expect that. Like Soy talked about earlier, you can expect that those things are going to happen, but know that when you expect those things and those things come your way, you can stand confident in the fact that I've already been there, I've already done that, and I've overcome that, which means you have victory, that you are more than conquerors because of Jesus Christ, and that is a reason to celebrate. That's where your confidence comes from, and it's regardless of your situation. It's regardless of what's happening in your life. It's that I'm going to actually live in my reality, and I'm going to party in the middle of it. I'm not going to party to escape it. I'm going to party in the middle of it. Now, this biblical type of partying as a lifestyle is actually marked, like I said, by supernatural joy. And what you know about supernatural joy is it is a joy that the world cannot take away, that nobody can take away from you. It's inside of you. It's not just about your happiness. It's not just about what you want. It's about you living out your life in celebration and honor to the God who loves you. And again, like I said, if church isn't fun and it's not exciting, and if church isn't engaging, and if church isn't something that you get excited about coming to, then guess what? We're doing it all wrong. We're doing it all wrong. And here's what I want to say about that. I want to be real. I'm not talking about some spiritual emotionalism. Don't get me wrong in that. I'm not talking about, about some spiritual emotionalism. It's not about whoever's up here that he or she has to somehow kind of crank it up for you. It's not about whoever's speaking that weekend has to get you all fired up and get you to remember about the good news of Jesus Christ. No. You, you, we don't need another spiritual hype man. Matter of fact, we don't need a spiritual hype man at all. You know what we need? We need a life-giving relationship with Jesus. Because when you have a life-giving relationship with Jesus, you show up to church with an expectation and an anticipation that we are already going to party. Nobody has to pump you up and get you excited about Jesus. You walk in through the doors, and you can't wait to celebrate just how good he's been in your life all throughout the week that you are alive, that you are breathing. And regardless of your circumstance, you are here right now ready to engage the presence of God. That's what it means to be a people who party. <laughs> That's what it means to be a, a people who, who celebrate a life celebrating Jesus and who he is. I told the 830 service and the 10 o'clock service this, and I'll tell you this. I'm at the point of my message where I realized that uh, I actually have two messages <laughs> that I prepared for today, and both of them are on your notes. So I'm going to leave you with the angst and anxiety that you're not going to get all your feelings today. And I want you to know that it's okay. Come back next week, okay? We'll pick up where we left off. Because here's, here's the real deal. I'll let you into my head. When I was preparing this message, I was like, okay, this last part of this message that I want to talk about with these fill-ins right here, I think, it's, I think it's good. I think we need to know about that. But I'm like, should I do it this week or should I do it next week? Should I do it this week? Should I do it next week? And I was like, oh, man. Like, it could go either way, but how did you do it this week, right? I shouldn't have done that, okay? Um, <laughs> So what's going to happen is we'll do it next week, okay? And we'll give you new notes, or you can keep the notes that you have, but just, but just know that, that I'm going to take you to the last part of, this, of these notes because I'm going, to, I'm going to issue you a challenge. This is where that last part actually gets you to, but I'm just going to get you there a little bit quicker, and we'll talk more about it next week. Here's the challenge. What if, what if you and I actually lived this out? 
Here's what I'm saying. What if you and I actually lived this out and it wasn't just on Sunday? The celebration and the party at City Line Church is always something to look forward to, always something to be excited about, always something that is needed. But what if you and I took the party here out there? What am I saying? I'm saying, what if you actually had some real tangible parties for people in your life that you know just need to experience the love of Jesus, just need to experience the joy of celebration? What am I talking about? I'm talking about, you know what? Maybe there's some people in your office that bug the junk out of you. <laughs> and maybe instead of letting them bug the junk out of you, you show up this week and you are the party patrol. You show up, and man, on Monday, you got coffee and bagels, you know what I'm saying? And you got streamers, you know? And the next day, guess what? You know what? You got, wah, 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 wah. you know, you got like, you come in Tuesday morning, like, it's Tuesday, like, why the horns? Because you're here, and we're excited to see you, right? What are you doing? I'm throwing a party for you. What's gotten into you? Nothing. I'm, this is just who I am. I'm a party people. I, I, I'm, I'm a Jesus follower, and, 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 and there's a joy that flows out of me. What, what, if, what if it's a, a people in your neighborhood that you know that God's put on your heart, and you've been thinking, I should probably get to know them. And it's always been weird, you know what I mean, about like, you know, dinner at your house because you're like, I don't really know them that well. How about you just threw them a party then in your front yard and had dinner in the yard? Like dinner in the driveway. Is dinner too much? Drinks in the driveway. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. What does that look like for you to just connect with them and just throw a party? Here's the deal. Just because. What does it look like to gather together with your community group and figure out how are ways that we can bless others in our community by throwing them a party? Is there a local shelter with homeless people that we can show up, we can connect with them and say, hey, look, here's what we want to do. We just want to come in and we just want to throw a party. Why would you do that? We just want to get to know them. We want them to know that they're loved. Here's what we're not showing up to do. We're not showing up to be weird Jesus people. You know what I'm talking about. You do the little Jesus juke. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you invite them over and then it's like the bait and switch. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, did you like that dinner? Okay, great. Now let me tell you about this prayer that you pray. <laughs> Three simple steps. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like, hey, you know, I'm going to invite you over to a World Cup party and then at halftime, you know what I mean, after everybody's had a good time and they're going to the kitchen, like, yeah, hurry up and get your chicken wings at the kitchen because when you come back, we got devotion. <laughs> You're like, what? Yeah, chicken and devotion. You're like, no. <laughs> No. This is not to do weird stuff like that. This is just to simply ex ex extend love. It's to simply just say, hey, you know what? I care for you. Hey, you know, there, there's shelters around here that, that are, are, are places where, where women that have experienced domestic violence. Our, the sisterhood just, just celebrated them and, and, and raised some money for them. And you know what? What, what, if, what if it looked like some of the women in the church just went over and said, you know what? Let's just party with you. Let's just bring some joy back. Let's bring celebration back. Let's help others see that you were created to be a, a people of joy and a people of celebration regardless of what's going on in your life. What does that look like? Some of you got kids in summer school and nobody likes summer school. What if you threw a party for your kid's summer school class? I don't know what that looks like and you can figure it out. Here, how about this? What if some of you, you need to throw a party and that party looks like hosting neighborhood VBS in your front yard? All you got to do is open up the front yard. When we talk about neighborhood VBS, it's for all of our kids here at the church. We just don't do it here at the church. We just say, guess what? We've got five to six locations all around our community. We're asking you to go to them, to celebrate with them, to throw a party with them, to help them to know the love that you found in Jesus Christ, to help them to see that there's a joy that flows from you that the world cannot take away. What if we chose to live that out? Your last fill-in on your notes just simply is this. And like I said, I'll, I'll give you the other ones next week, but we party because we have a reason to celebrate. I want you to know that first and foremost. We have a reason to celebrate. But you know what? We also party because we take serious the call of God on our lives to help people discover and follow Jesus. We're serious about it. I want you to be serious about it. This summer, summer is, is party central, right? <laughs> you got graduation parties. You've got all kinds. I mean, my life has been a party for the last two months. Some of you see it on social media. You're just like, man, like enough already with the sheets. You know what I mean? Like, 
I mean, like May was like Linda's birthday, Micah's birthday, Mother's Day, and Zion's birthday. June rolls around, you got Micah's graduation, Jack's birthday, Father's Day, and Jack and Linda's anniversary. Mm, you know what I mean? It's like, anything else you want to celebrate? I'm like, we like to knock it all out in just two months, right? But we know this, right? All throughout summer, there's no shortage of graduation parties, no shortage of, of, of babies being born or, or going to celebrate someone that's with child. Or, or maybe there's you know, birthday parties that are just kind of nonstop, whatever that is. What if we said that we're going to take this summer <laughs> to begin to give some joy-filled parties just because? Just because we can, just because we are a party people. Would you consider about what that looks like in your life and that next step? And would you allow God over these next few weeks just to open you up to the new thing that he wants to do in your life as he changes your perspective on how you live your life. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you much for your grace. Thank you so much for your mercy. Thank you for your love for us. Jesus, we thank you that uh, you created us to be a people of celebration. Lord, not to walk with our head down, not to get overwhelmed, Lord God, by the circumstances in our life, but Lord, to continue to keep our focus on you, to remember who you are, to remember what you've done and to anticipate what you have still yet to do and what you want to do in our life. God, we know that the best is still yet to come. So Father, work in our hearts today, move in our lives today, do an incredible work in us and through us. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm gonna ask the band to come, come out right now and they're, they're gonna start to worship with us in these next few moments. And church, before you put everything away, here's what I, I wanna do. There's some people here that uh, today is baptism weekend. It's a celebration. We had three baptized at 8.30. We had one baptized at 10 o'clock. If you're here and you want to be baptized today, you sign up to be baptized, I'm going to ask you to head right out to the lobby. There's people there to help you. Um, you can change your clothes right now. You can get all together and ready to go. Um, you have plenty of time to do that. We're going to continue to worship. And church, we're going to celebrate those that are being baptized today because this is a party. This is what it's all about. It's about us celebrating what God is doing in and through their life. It's about us celebrating that the old is gone and that the new has come. And there's nothing better than that. And so I want you to know that if you're here today, yeah, you can clap it up for that. If you're here today and maybe God's nudging on your heart that you need to be baptized and you didn't come prepared to be baptized or you didn't think you forgot today was baptism Sunday, we just want you to know that, uh, that we have prepared for you. <laughs> if you do want to be baptized today, we believe that when, when what we read in Scripture is that when people believed in Jesus, their next step was baptism. So it's not a matter of should I or shouldn't I. It's that if you have placed your life in the hands of Jesus and said yes to him, our question to you is what are you waiting for? So we've got clothing out there for you. We've got shorts. We've got shirts. If you're willing to go home with your hair wet, we've even got towels, whatever that is, right? You can change out of what you have now. We'll give you something dry to put on so that you can be baptized right here, right now. We just, don't, we just want to remove the obstacles that sometimes are in our way of taking a next step with Jesus. But church, as the worship team sings, would you just continue to, continue to worship with us? And as those uh, come in and ready for baptism, uh, we'll lead you in that as well. God bless.